Whelan Presley and Van Ho Funeral Homes have been serving Quad City families and veterans for over 100 years. Whelan Presley is located in Rock Island, Milan, Reynolds, and Van Ho in East Moline, proudly supporting WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. The caucuses are over. Donald Trump won. So what's next? The future of the caucuses after caucus night in the cities. It wasn't the most attended caucus in caucus history. Sub-zero temperatures after a weekend blizzard, but it was still an impressive turnout for some. Every four years, Iowa becomes the epicenter of national politics, and it was again this year for Republicans. But will it ever be again? We talked with two leaders of Scott County Party politics, Janita McNulty, the chair of the Scott County Republicans, and Kay Pence, the head of Scott County Democrats. Caucus nights, very different for Republicans and Democrats. They used to be very similar, but let's start, well, let's start with Republicans. How did caucus night go? Excellent. We, it was a great turnout, you know, sub-zero temperatures. So we were very pleased with the turnout. Um, everyone had a great time. The feedback has been that they had fun and that's what it's all about. You come together with your neighbors, your friends, your family, and you have fun, but you make a very important decision. And Iowans turned down in sub-zero temperatures to do that, like they always do, so very conscientious. So we're very pleased with how it turned out in Scott County. The other thing is always is nerve-wracking is the vote counting, um, and how is it going to go? I mean, Democrats obviously had some problems in, in the last, uh, uh, last caucus. Republicans did as well a few caucuses ago, where it was such a close election between Mitt Romney and Rick oh, yes. Santorum. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I thought I'd bring that back yes, up. Yes, thank you. But this time it was, it was very easy count for Republicans. It was, yes, yes. You know, each caucus site did their own counting, and then there was a new web app where the reporter for each caucus would put in the results for each candidate, and it worked really, really well. Because there were some concerns, because what the Democrats experienced four years ago was a little bit of hacking, some uh, bad actors, as we were calling it, uh, getting involved, uh, making phone calls, uh, really trying to create mayhem. You didn't see that, it seemed. This was web-based. It wasn't based, you know, the, you had the phone calling. But this was web-based, it was secure. Um, the reporters were trained very well by RPI. And it really couldn't have gone better. Kay, let's talk about the Democrats, because you're back to, what, square one, where the caucus was really about party building mm -hmm. and, and creating uh, um, candidates, not candidates, but delegates uh, for, right. for future conventions. So how did the Democratic caucuses go? Well, they went really good because we really didn't know what to expect uh, with the weather being so bad and being the first time of this type of caucus. Uh, our doors were supposed to open at 6. We had people showing up at 5 o'clock. And uh, we had more volunteers than we knew what to do with. People were really enthused. Uh, we were fortunate in Scott County because Christina Bohannon, our first congressional district, was going to be there. And so she got a wonderful reception. So were people showing up a little disappointed because they thought they might be filling out these uh, preference cards at the site and, and, and found out that they weren't able to do that? We had uh, the request forms at the site, and we were, had people there with laptops to help them sign up online so they could get their preference card mailed to them. And the turnout for people requesting preference cards are going really well. Um, and then they can continue to request them through February. So we expect to have a much broader turnout than we would have ever had in a in-person caucus, especially this year when the weather was so terrible. Well, let's talk about that. The Democrats are, uh, if, if you're a Democrat in Iowa, you can request a, a presidential preference card mm -hmm. um, online. Uh, go to uh, iowademocrats.org. Um, and, and they have to return them by February 19th? 
No, they, they can, can request them up to the 19th. 19th, all right. And then the counting of them won't be until March 5th. That's when that's when it will be reported, which is Super Tuesday, yep. when I will be lumped in with a whole lot of different states. Yes. Um, this has really been a huge comp compromise with the DNC, so that Iowa could be first in the nation for Democrats in a way, yes. but reporting is much later. I mean, that's pretty much the reason why the Democrats are doing it this round. Well, but one of the things that, this was my concern for a long time. When when you start to have only in-person caucuses, you really limit the number of people that can show up. Because if you have someone that works second shift, a hospital worker, a firefighter, uh, people with young children, older people that don't like to drive at night in the middle of the winter, um, we're expanding our access. And I think that's important because when you look at how the Republican turned out, uh, the majority of them believe that the election was stolen. And, uh, you know, then Trump won solidly. But when you look at half the voters voted against him, it's just wondering, um, are they putting forth their best candidate? I mean, they can pick whoever they want. I'm fine with that. But um, I think that you end up with a more extreme group voting rather than your whole base. Well, Janita, obviously you want to respond to that as well. <laughs> That's totally not true. You know, having been in a very diverse caucus, um, that's not true. We had young people, we had older people. Um, people work different shifts during a regular election day as well. So you can get there. There was plenty of notice. People were able to get to the caucus if they wanted to get to the caucus. We had several parents that brought their children and they were welcome. So I, the caucus was wonderful. Uh, we hope that we're always blessed to continue to have it. Um, we had national media that one NBC reporter said he had never seen a base of voters as intelligent, well-informed, and as enthusiastic as what were at the caucus site he was at. That drives me crazy. This is the reason why, is that every four years I hear these national correspondents say, I don't care about Iowa. These caucuses are ridiculous. Then they come here and they say, oh my gosh, these people really know what they're talking about. They're really passionate. Mm -hmm. um, this is really an interesting process. And some would say a true democratic process that goes back to you know the town halls of, of New England back yes. in the 1700s. Um, but isn't it a dying breed? The caucuses is because you're seeing Minnesota doesn't have it anymore. Uh, uh, Nevada doesn't have it anymore. So we're um, even more unique, Jim, <laughs> than but, ever. But what's interesting, but I don't think the parties necessarily like the caucuses because it does bring out, I, I don't want to say fringe, but, but, but people who are much more impassioned, especially in Iowa, for candidates who may not be the mainstream in both parties. I mean, we've mm -hmm. seen it time and again. We see all different types of people. So um, I would argue that's not true. And everyone is welcome and we, they all come. So I, I don't think that's a true statement. One of the great things about the caucuses though, and we've seen it with the Democrats and the Republicans as well, is that when there is a number of candidates and it is really close and you've got these surrogates that are trying to win over uh, people to vote for them, um, and, and that kind of brings the uh, energy and the excitement to the caucuses as well. It does. And at our site, we had folks from out of state and there was a woman from Florida speaking on behalf of one of the candidates and her mother had been a, a county chair in Florida. So she was very attuned to politics. And she was just in awe of the process. She loved the caucus process. And there was an international crew with us from Australia. They were in awe. So anyone that, that truly goes and participates, they love it. We had a lot of new uh, people that helped us with the caucus that hadn't attended much. They came in the office yesterday and thanked us for asking them to be volunteers and talked about a wonderful experience it was. So it's something very unique to Iowa. And I know the Republicans will always work very hard to keep it because it's just, it's so Iowa. It's so Iowa. And, and, and Kay, for, for the Democrats, that was a central part every four years right. of the caucuses. That's going to be probably no more. Do you really think that as far as the caucuses were for Democrats this year, that's the best it's going to be? Well, one of the things that, you know, happened this year, the Republicans selected the date and they chose a national holiday. Uh, Martin Luther King Day. So we were able to honor Martin Luther King, and uh, we had a video that 
um, a progressive group had put on and showing the local activists that were active back in Martin Luther King's day and that are still active in the community today. And it brought up uh, memories, you know, that our democracy is important and we have come a long way. And uh, I'm afraid that there are some people on the other side who would like to take us backward. And uh, it really enthused the people when they thought about it. And you know, we got more involved uh, we raised more funds at our caucus than we normally do. That part was great. And uh, I'm just excited. I, I think that opening up to allow more people to participate and have their voices heard. I mean, in future years when we have uh, other candidates, you know, we'll have people, um, I'm sure, trying to convince people to select their candidate when the time comes for their cards. Uh, it's, it's an argument now if, if the Democrats continue doing uh, the presidential preference cards as opposed to a real caucus, that it's actually more of a primary than anything else. That's the criticism of what the Democrats are doing. It's not a caucus anymore. Well, you know, one of the things, though, you know, we have to let the, everyone speak. And if it is a primary versus a caucus, we still get together and, and talk about our candidates and talk about the issues. And you know, one of the things that we saw this year, um, CNN reported that the news media, you know, with the advertising, $123 million were spent on advertising in Iowa, just for Iowa. That's a lot of dark money, a lot of, you know, of course it's national money, corporate money, trying to sway the vote of individuals. And I don't think it serves democracy best when people are trying to buy our votes and then when we have candidates trying to out extreme each other so they can get coverage. But isn't that a typical election? I mean, we always have advertising that has that. This well, is no different than any other election. Whether that's good or bad, it's democracy. Well, the last time we had 84 million and we had two parties with a full slate of candidates in the state at the same time. So this is getting so overburdened to one side and so extreme. I fear for our democracy. Let's talk about the advertising, because whenever there's a caucus or an election, you do have really tough advertisements. And, and you've seen it with uh, Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy who was bombarding the airwaves, going after each other. I, I know that every party says once the election happens, we all come together, we all coalesce. But how tough is that when, when you see other Republicans going after other Republicans. When Ronald Reagan said, what was it, the 11th commandment is thou shall not attack. Ill, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, yeah, other yeah. Republicans. Um, we do come together. We know what it's all about, you know, and it's always been that way. You wanna win, so you throw everything you can at that other candidate, but then at the end of the day, we're all behind who our candidate is. And no one cares about democracy and the constitution more than Republicans. So some of these comments are pretty, ridiculous. Um, they're making lemons out of losing their caucus, and it's too bad the DNC took it away from them. We were hoping that they would be able to continue like the Republicans. It was wonderful that we each had the caucus. So um, we feel bad that they no longer have it, and they've had to come up with a secondary way to do it. So they're doing the best they can. I think it's also interesting, um, Janita, is that we, we hear that the Iowa caucuses don't necessarily pick a winner, but they winnow out the losers. That's that's generally what, what always happens. And I always thought it was interesting that in some ways the Iowa caucuses don't do it. It's those weeks and months leading up to the Iowa caucuses. So we had a number of candidates drop off, drop out even before anyone met on January 15th. Um, and and it, do you notice that as kind of a factor is that either they run out of money or the polling shows that they're doing so badly even before the caucuses begin? But the beauty of it is anyone can afford to come to Iowa and do the retail politics. And there's nowhere else they have that opportunity. You know, they may have limited funds, but they can come and meet the Iowans, shake their hands, have a conversation with them. And should we lose the Iowa caucus, that is gone. And so those, those candidates have that opportunity. Look at Santorum when he won that year. He didn't have a lot of money, but he came and he worked hard and he met the people. And so it would be a huge loss. But we're not gonna lose the First of the Nation Caucus for the Republican Party. And I think it's also interesting because the caucuses have changed somewhat. I mean, like you said, retail politics is so important. You saw, uh, as, as you pointed out, um, uh, DeSantis and, and Nikki Haley and, and Ramaswamy hitting 
almost every one, and in some cases, every single one of the 99 counties. But Donald Trump, on the other hand, holds these big rallies. And we also know that Hillary Clinton did rallies as well. And then it was almost that there was getting away from stopping at the coffee shop or meeting people in the a church basement. Is that a little bit of a concern of yours? Is that, and it's often the case of front runners that they don't have to do that, but that it is important for all the candidates to get out there and shake some hands? It is important. And you did see Donald Trump do much more of that this time than he did the first time he ran. So he's learned something about how to campaign in Iowa. So, you know, he went to the machine shed and a lot of various other places met the local people that were there. So I think it's maybe even coming back a little for some candidates, realizing how important it is. Because as you know, Kay, the ground game is so important. And since you don't have a Democratic candidate that is opposed to Joe Biden, he doesn't really have to come to do that retail politics in Iowa. Does that hurt down ticket? Well, I don't think it hurts down ticket because we focused on it. But you know, there are other candidates on the Democratic ballot. And you know that is one thing that's good about Iowa, where it is cheaper to um, campaign here. It's a small state, and um, some of the states charge the candidates to get their name on the ballot. You know, neither party here does, but in other states, they could charge pay up to a hundred thousand dollars just to get their name on the ballot. We are talking about, <laughs> of course, the preference, uh, the presidential preference selection yes. at at caucuses. But as you guys so well know, this is party building time. This is organization time. So, Kay, tell me, do you think, because you, you mentioned you did well fundraising mm -hmm. on caucus night, mm -hmm. um, not having the uh, presidential preference, is that going to have an impact as far as party building or even excitement or fundraising? Well, you know, it's just hard to say on going forward, but I think that we really stress the party building on having people come. And I was, again, really happy with the turnout that we had. Um, we had people that had caucused for the first time that came. And we had people that have done it for years. You know, people that have already sent in their, pref or already requested their presidential preference card, they still came. So I think that, you know, going forward, you know, we can continue focusing on the party building. And Janita, how about you as well? Because I mean, you're seeing that excitement, particularly among Donald Trump supporters, that, that you know, they are ready for a fight in 2024. We had new people as well. We had p new chairs, people getting involved. And yesterday our email was slammed with people that had attended and want to get involved. So um, having them there personally really gens up the excitement even more. So, um, and we as well collected a lot of great funds mm -hmm. for our party. So there's an excitement that you lose when you don't have the candidates meeting with the people. We are so blessed in Iowa that you and I have the opportunity to meet every single Republican candidate that comes. Meet them, have a conversation with them, express our concerns about the open border, the horrible economy right now. And if we didn't have the First of the Nation caucus, we would lose that. And the people of Iowa, by helping give a huge bounce to whoever is the winner of the caucus, really have an effect on what goes on in the world because we know that our president is a world leader and no one else has a unique opportunity that we do to have an influence on the world from here in Iowa. So we'll work as hard as we can to keep our First in the Nation caucus. I have a few minutes left. I really want to get to state issues because mm -hmm. as party chairs, I, I, the presidential election is such a big deal. But tell me about the race for a 2024 for state legislature in Iowa. You've got basically super majorities on both houses. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, the head of uh, the state government, the governor. Um, things are really turning more red in Iowa as far as uh, the governance goes. And that's good for the taxpayers. As you'll see, this legislative session, you're going to see some great bills that are good for the taxpayers. Democrats, on the other hand, need to get to come together. Uh, you have not had good election cycles across the state of Iowa. Right. And I, I think that um, you know, we have a good history in Iowa. We have a good history of being accepting and being diverse. And you know, we were one of the first in the nation for desegregating our schools. We were one of the first in the nation for gay marriage. Um, we were uh, protecting the women's right to choose uh, and the freedom for their health care. You know, so we have so many things that people have taken for granted. And I think the pendulum swung so far in Des Moines that the extremism, uh, people are concerned. 
And on one hand, the other party will worry about what bathroom a child goes to, and we're worrying about whether or not we have clean water in, in our state. If the Democrats don't do well in November in Iowa, what does that say, though? That you don't have quality candidates or that Iowans agree with what has been going on in the legislature? No, I think that's part of the reason we had such good turnout last night is the fear of the extremism, that, that they're going too far on um, uh, taking away money from public schools uh, when they're now that they're thinking of coming after the AEA is cutting their funding. You know, we have a lot of rural school districts that really depend on the AEA. And we saw that with the um, of shooting at Perry School, all those counselors that came in there, those were from the AEAs. You know, so if we have a small rural school district, they don't have the services that you might expect in Des Moines or Davenport. When we're, when we're talking about the AEA, it's the uh, area education associations, which are large, I don't know, overseers of school districts and the governor in her uh, condition of the state address saying that she wants to take uh, 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 special education money away from AEA, give it more to the local school districts um, because she thinks they're ineffective in what they're doing. So that is what you're getting at. So let's talk about what's going to happen in this coming session, because the governor did talk a lot about uh, uh, finances, um, uh, 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 income taxes uh, being lowered down the road. You believe that you have a very strong message to tell voters uh, for November. Absolutely. Does it worry you, though, that there is also the social issues that, that some people think that the Republicans have gone too far in Des Moines? They've not gone too far. You know, so that's ridiculous. So she talked about people that had gone to their caucus because they were worried about right-wing extremism. We had many Republic Democrats change their voter registration prior to the caucus night, came into the office, we would ask why. And they said, we see what's happening in our country and it can't continue. So they're leaving the Democrat party because the open border, the horrible economy. They have to buy groceries and gas and they're stressed because no one is helping them out and it's coming from DC. So they're turning to the Republicans and the Republicans in Iowa will take care of the, the voters. I only have less than a minute left. So I want one quick answer. And I think you've already given, give me the, your prognosis of the future of the uh, uh, Iowa caucuses for 2028. It's strong and safe and will continue. As far as the Democrats are concerned? I think it's strong too, and especially with the extremism on the other side. And you know, when we talk about Iowa, we're leading the nation in defective roads and bridges. That's federal money that we're seeing put to work right now. Um, our school districts used to be no number one in the nation. They're not anymore. People are getting concerned that this pendulum is swinging too far to the right, and it's time to bring it home to uh, caring about everyday Iowans. And you think the number one issue in the election, tell me nationally, is? The open borders and our economy. And the Democrats are leading and letting illegals into our country by the millions, so they should be very proud of that as well. And the key, uh, key role of the state government would be? To take care of Iowans. All right. Key role of the state? I think I agree taking care of Iowans and not just the big corporations. Janita McNulty, the chair of Scott County Republicans, and Kay Pence, the head of Scott County Democrats. Well, you know it's cold when the Mississippi River freezes over. Welcome to January in the cities. And the river has been the source of music for hundreds of years. Still is. Musician David G. Smith recently joined us again to share some of his original music. So here's David G. Smith with Listen to the River. My wife is sitting right off camera here. That is a anniversary gift from uh, my wife. And uh, now I like to tell it that we were out looking for sewing machines. It's true, we were looking for sewing machines. And, uh, but we walked by this music store first and she saw that guitar uh, sitting in the window and she said, what's that? And two hours later, we walked out with it. She bought it for me, anniversary gift. Jay was a friend of mine He used to sing to me all the time There was a reputation to then again He used to sing to me and I'd sing to him Well, I'm down here by the river I sit beneath the tree I'm gonna listen to the river The river gonna talk to me Summer wind was a friend of mine From the ocean to the mountains 
mountain pine Use the sand to soothe the rain Now it's flooding hurricane Well I'm down by the river Sitting beneath the tree I'm gonna listen to the river I wrote that song, goodness, a long time ago. I don't want to date myself. Many years ago. It's about our environment, kind of some of the things that maybe it was just a prescient moment I had uh, when I wrote it, you know, again, 20, 30 years ago about what's going on these days. And uh, so it's, you know, to keep it short, it's just, it's about uh, environment and it's about, I guess, climate change and uh, some of those things. Well, I'm down here by the river, sitting beneath the tree. The river gonna talk to me Well, I'm down here by the river Sitting beneath the tree I'm gonna listen to the river But the river won't talk The river won't talk David G. Smith with Listen to the River. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. and Van Ho Funeral Homes have been serving Quad City families and veterans for over 100 years. Whelan Presley is located in Rock Island, Milan, Reynolds, and Van Ho in East Moline, proudly supporting WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.